So welcome to Manchester Games Students Network and this session, Games and Probation. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Emma Murray, from, uh, who's a senior lecturer in criminal justice at Liverpool John Moores University, and Huat Young, who is an amazing artist. And both of them have been working together on a project that they're going to talk to us about, and then we're hopefully going to have the opportunity to play as well. So, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having us. Um, probationary, the game of life on license, is a or the product of a collaboration between um, us as an institution in terms of at John Moore's, FACT, um, the Foundation of Arts and Creative Technology in Liverpool, and also um, our work with the Halloween Penal Reform. So we started, this was the pilot project, and the game has now completely dwarfed the questions we had in the pilot project, and it's become an awful lot more important um, in <coughs> some ways than, than we expected to as a pilot. But the idea is to explore how a collaboration between criminologists and artists who have, a, I suppose, an, an audience and a platform in policy debates, what happens when we all come together and make a piece of work which explores their lived experiences of the probation service, um, what sort of, where can that art go in, in that process? So it was produced through socially engaged art workshops, and I know that her lawyer will, will tell you all about her practice in a little while. Um, it takes its player on, it takes each player on four sort of journeys. So there are four characters. There were more than four men. So there is a process there where during the workshops, people had to negotiate and talk about it communicate what the best four characters might be. So it doesn't each character doesn't reflect one of the co-authors, I guess is what's important there. And we kind of take as our starting point that four games reflect back to a society, for example, the method of the game of life. Um, and doing that we believe that this reflects back to us the lived experiences of being on probation. Now I suppose importantly from our perspective as criminologists involved in that, the artwork was made at a time of um, great turbulence of the probation service. Lots of different policies were starting to, to have real impact um, on the ground, and we, who play in this game, think that some of those are brought to life differently than we would have been able to do through our own research methods, i.e. interviews, questionnaires, and so on. So it is an interdisciplinary project, um, which works on the intersections between, um, I guess, cultural theory, Sociology, criminology, art, co-production, politics, and so forth. We believe it raises ethical questions. So, if you do have some uh, ethical concerns or questions, um, you know we'd love to talk to you about those. We also believe that it raises some really interesting epistemological and ontological questions that we're not sort of finished answering as yet. Um, but uh, through this co-inquiry, I suppose the result is what you have in front of you there. Now, well, we gave some thought about how to present this to you today. This is the first time that it's been presented, certainly with the academic team there, outside of a criminology environment. So that's really, really interesting for me. Usually, Hawa, um, or most frequently, Hawa is taken into our spaces, whereas uh, today I've been taken, I suppose, into hers. So I find that really, really interesting already. So what we decided to do is, instead of trying to kind of artificially create some sort of coherent narrative for you all of this is what we did and we intended to do it all of the time and it all worked out perfectly um, is to be a little bit more honest about that and um, just talk about what probationary is from both of our perspectives because Kawhi well, and I don't agree on what this is <laughs> <laughs> and we've been doing this for eight, 18 months now it was meant to be a five week pilot project um, and 18 months later, we still don't have the answers and there's still endless possibilities. So we decided in this sort of kind of first half an hour of us talking to you before you get to play the game and ask us a lot of questions to feed into it, that we're just going to kind of tell you, we're going to answer three questions from the perspective of an academic team, um, particularly around criminology and interested in the content of the game and those who, who made it with Wa and from um, Hawa Young's perspective as well, and hopefully from you all. So the first question um, is, what is it? And if that's okay, I am going to kick off. What is that in terms of, uh, from a criminologist's perspective? It's a piece of art made in, in art workshops. And I suppose uh, for those working um, within the criminal justice system, you'll know that there's a real increase of the use of arts with those that are serving a sentence. 
those kind of art forms are as vast as they are varied. And they kind of take place in a series of different ways, but particularly around prevention. So arts groups get involved um, from a perspective of prevention. They also do that as a form of intervention um, and also in terms of resettlement. As long as kind of the creative, effective and ref reflective um, are given space, then as criminologists we would understand that as an arts work within the system. And since the kind of early 2000s, they are growing in number quite significantly, um, and more and more so. We now have the Arts Council, for example, are going through their consultation on how they can work differently um, with the criminal justice system. Most of the research that's done, particularly from a criminologist's perspective, until perhaps this point, do correct me um, if you know of any other projects, have been around the kind of impact on engaging in the arts on the individual very much about the kind of therapeutic and transformative results um, of engaging in art in that way. When we got together with this, we wanted to understand, I guess, something slightly different, which was art as a vehicle for, in, for not only individual change, but political change. Art as a way that we can start to question systems. And as you, as you come to preservation in a little while, you'll see that you know, the board is representing a system. So, that's kind of where we got to. So we paired up, or we partnered up, I should say, with the Housing for Penal Reform to see actually what can they do um, with this game. So as, as a piece of art. Um, and I suppose a spoiler for in a little while, um, when you start to talk about um, the kind of effective and the emotion that, that is kind of comes from playing the game, um, when you start to take that into policy, arenas, they want this to be a tool. So we're straight away underpinning um, what probationary is from a criminologist, criminologist perspective, is this is a piece of art made in collaboration that we were very, very privileged to be able to watch and, and engage with. But when we do our bit of the, the kind of job, which was okay, um, how can we then take this art into those arenas to affect real change within the criminal justice system without reducing the art? Um, we're that one was still stuck there 15 months later. We don't know how you don't reduce this as a piece of art. Um, but we would say that it isn't a tool, and for the, from a criminologist's perspective, again, for the following reasons. Um, it's not representative of all of those that are going through that system. The board game was labeled six white men in Merseyside um, because they were the people that were in that group. So that would be kind of the first reason that we're we're quite reluctant to, to be seen as a tool at the moment. Um, and the second reason, I guess, for that um, is because those that were involved in the making of the game signed up for an arts workshop. They didn't sign up for their voices to be then kind of reappropriated and taken back to the, to the very state in which they are, are critiquing and used against them. So that's from, again, that's from a criminologist's perspective um, of why we are where we're at. So I guess. From us, the last sort of comment I'll make from my perspective of, of what it is, um, I think that really this is a creative research design from our perspective. Um, it's an innovative way to disseminate findings <coughs> from our perspective. Um, and it's also uh, an immersive learning experience in many ways, or particularly um, that has allowed <coughs> us to open up questions, not just about what happens on probation, but how that feels um, from a very, very deeply emotional level. I was never going to tell you what cheap is probation is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, next slide. So, um, when a lot talks, it goes into colour. So, i um, Oh, and please feel free to jump in at any point. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you stressed that it's not a tool, um, and it's, I think it's taken a while for you to, maybe not you personally, but the other academics on the team to realize it's not a tool, and uh, it's not a, um, uh, a learning object as well. So for me, when um, I was first commissioned to do this, um, I, I have no background in criminal justice at all. Um, so for me, I wanted to know um, what it was like to be on probation. So I have no, 
contact with this world at all. So um, I think the, the reason I used, uh, so I needed my, the people that I was working with to inform me about what, what, um, what their lives are like. And um, to me, that sort of inquiry is how I see art. And um, the best way, I think, to get an overall picture is through dialogue. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do with the men uh, in a friendly way so that it w it's in a different approach to how academics uh, would go through their research. And um, I think you mentioned like the way the people that you research refer to academics as clipboards. You just go in, ask the same questions, and they have standard responses because they know how to game the system to get out or leave or whatever. Um, so um, the interesting thing about like why I wanted to use the board game format, uh, um, and this was a proposal that I made to fact. They didn't ask me to make a board game. I suggested, could I make a board game with the men? Um, it was because there's a lot of inherent rules in board games. and. For, for people who are under that sort of system, I think they would have thought a lot about rules, regulations, but also how to go about them. Uh, and I think through playing, you, you, you always do that. You know the rules, but knowing them means you could break them. And that comes about in play. Um, and, the, and, that, the, and again, why this is an art object and not a design object uh, is because I didn't have a clear objective when I was making it. Um, so I didn't want to motivate anyone's behavioral in a way that uh, you kind of do with design. So there's always a clear um, problem to solve when you're looking at something from a design perspective. And from an artist's perspective, I didn't want to solve a problem. I wanted to ask a question, uh, which is always, what's life like observation? Um, and again, like the important bit of doing it as a group, doing it as a group activity, was to get away from how art is usually used in a crypto <coughs> system as a way to make someone better, which is very like ethically dubious, I feel, um, was to not get the men to make a board game each, so like this is how I feel about probation, but to have them, and me, and all the criminologists, and the probation officers, everyone who was in the workshop, um, on a flat hierarchy, I think which is rare in these sort of workshops, to agree together about what the system is. And I felt that um, by this process of negotiation, we could see that, um, it is more nuanced. It isn't just a strict get out of jail, do this, do that, get a job, get a house. No, that's not what uh, being on probation is like. And um, so that was quite important, that everyone could see how everyone fits in together. And it was important that we had criminologists in the workshop and the probation officers. Um, because one of the things that I think you said is that just because you're in the system doesn't mean you know it. You, you have your understanding of the system, and um, it kind of, uh, it, and you make logical like analysis of why things are, you know, sort of like um, like cargo cults, you know, like the people in the islands who think if you build a runway, things will drop down, you know. So I wanted those kind of discussions to happen, start happen, and to have like different points of view be there to say, well, actually, that doesn't happen. You don't get recalled like that, or you know, like all those discussions that we were able to have was because we had people from different levels of the criminal justice system there. So I hope that it gave a more holistic view of probation, even though, um, as we said, it's not representative because it is just six white men. Um, so yeah, so that's how I see it, and uh, saw it, and still see it as as a way to kind of question things together. And I think, yeah, um, what you touched upon there in terms of methods is really, really interesting. Um, from the, any of you from a more social scientific background, we went into the workshops um, with ethical 
sort of approval to observe um, to observe those workshops. And when we got in there, Hawa oh, said, no, 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 nobody observes my practice, we're all participants in here. Um, and we got round the table, and it was to try and find our space of who we were in that room was really, really interesting. Um, and, and then kind of reconsulting our, our ethics form and so on, because what, what were we doing? So, you know, for those again in the room that are from social science background, they would see that we were then sort of reading data or changing data and so on, but actually it wasn't data because our research question was who are the criminologists in the room and what is the potential? We didn't know that probationary was going to be a result of that, that workshop or I suggested she may make a board game, but when she gets there, she doesn't think it's an appetite for it, she'll do something else. So we were all a little blind at that point um, and so I think that's really, really interesting, particularly around truth. So um, I guess... Had we been there as facilitators, we would have corrected some of the stuff. We would have said, well, actually, is that the way it works? We would have maybe challenged a little bit more some of the stuff that was being said by the men around the table. So there was a few times, for example, where the men would say, this is what happens. And from, from our perspective, that's not what happens. That's your experience of the next step. But that's not actually the broader structure. So we had a long conversation about whether the board should reflect the structure um, of probation and all of its changes at the time, or whether the board should represent the men in the room's understanding of that space. And what the board does is reflect the men in the room's understanding of that system with us there as um, people to kind of fill in the blanks or give it official names or put it into some sort of context. So I think that was really interesting from the very, very first, first workshop of what was our role within that group. Um, if we were participants, then did we need to correct? Um, if we were participants, did we need to, I don't know, offer maybe some of our political values again around some of this? Or were we there more to um, facilitate on tables? Or were we actually there to observe and every now and again talk? And I think that is, um, again, why we're 18 months down the line here, because there's um, four criminologists who are the academic team on here, and I, I, sh I should say that, Dr. Will Jackson. Uh, Dr. Steve Waitman um, and also Anne Hayes um, that aren't with me today. We're still working that out of how we're going to make sense of what happened. So I guess that's the first thing um, about our next question, which is what did we think about the process? So um, we went into this trying to come up with a model and that model was a model of working down the line between criminologists, fact, but any, any kind of artistic project where we could observe the art, be part of that, and then take the key messages from that art into a policy debate. You know, down to the Howard League or into different select committees and so on and say, you know, this is, this is what we learn from engaging with participants in this way. And we won't, at the end of this, we have decided as a group that we wouldn't come up with a model. The reason we wouldn't come up with a model is we think actually what's more appropriate is to have a set of principles um, of working in this way. You can't particularly have a model because every academic group, every artist, every art form is so different that <coughs> we wouldn't want to do that. So that's kind of where we started. But in terms of the process, um, I guess for us, these are the questions we have ethically. Um, from our perspective, it is unethical to name your participants or name the space in which um, this took place. And I know that well, you'll talk about this in a sec, or if you want to now that from an arts perspective it's actually unethical not to name the participants. <laughs> um, so do you want, do you want to comment? No, 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 no. Um, so we, I mean that was the first kind of thing where we were like um, sat in the workshop very, very, very sort of distressed about how how that would because it was so alien to us to think that you would that you would name the men and the space in which this happened. Um, but then again from, from our arts perspective partner's perspective, from Pat's perspective, and also from the large, you have to, they're not co-producers if you're not acknowledged in that way. So that was the first thing, and we still have no answers for that. Um, Participate, really, really honestly, where, where we go from there. Um, if we're in a chronological space, we don't name, and if we're in an art space, or, or perhaps in this format, or we'll choose to name, then we'll evolve. Um, participation. Again, I've kind of touched on this, but what does it mean to participate? But not only what does it mean for us to participate in those workshops and for the men to participate in this process, 
but actually I'd ask you what it means for you to sit down and participate in this tonight. Um, I'd ask you to think about that in terms of what does it mean to what we're um, at the moment writing an article to play the pains of probation. What does this mean? I expected, I don't know how I'll say that, we've been on it and I thought we're, at some point somebody's going to take objection, um, perhaps to the trivialisation of some of this, but ultimately we've been absolutely astounded with the positive response because you, know, you will have, when you play it, you will be frustrated and you will feel emotional in that process. So we're still talking, of, talking about that. Um, I guess as well in terms of the commitment to voice, um, in terms of the process that was really interesting, you know, my, my usual mode of inquiry is interview. And I think I'm really, really innovative if I go interview twice and do a few different things to allow people to have a voice within them what I write about. Um, but actually, this, you know, this is, this is on the whole of the level for that. And what I was really interested in is why the men came back week after week after week to be involved in this. So we asked them that. Um, and most of that was because they believed that there would be something material that could take their voices somewhere and because um, it wasn't their personal story, which they had been asked time and time again. This was a collective negotiation of a lot of different, very difficult experiences. Um, and they didn't always agree, as, as we didn't always agree. So I think for that, there was a real, what I learned during the process is, or what's changed my particular practice, is about how long you spend with people before you, you kind of um, decide truth. And without getting into a very kind of deep conversation about truth here, I think the most interesting thing is when you ask them, for example, what is the next step? The men would tell you what the next step was, but then when they started to play the game, actually what you realised was that emotions and different things were much more important to them. So when you ask them, you know, what's the most important thing to you, you've got to get a job. You have to get a job. You don't get recalled, and you have to get a job. But actually when you start watching the men discuss how gameplay would happen, that's when emotions start to come in in a way that we wouldn't have been able to uncover ourselves. Um, so I think all of our practices have been altered through that process. Um, I, you know, particularly speaking for myself about how what how I was able to do within that space was transform it. Um, when I go into two spaces like that, I almost come back to them. Um, I get in with much about that. We come another clipboard. Um, in terms of you know when you say you're a criminologist um, and how kind you try to be, there is you know, it's a, a particular assumption that is linked. Whereas the wall completely transformed that space. Um, went in with tea and biscuits and, and completely transformed that space week on week and, and just to watch the way pe even, you know, people, the sign of difference in people through through Hoar's practice um, has made us all kind of rethink how we do our own research. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> more colour. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know it was so transformative. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought I, I'd just let you know a little bit like um, what went on during the five weeks. So this is more of a logistically what we did. So it was five uh, weeks, two workshops per week, Tuesday, Wednesday, three hours each. It was quite intense. The um, I wouldn't usually do such a short project. My projects are usually six months and over uh, because you do have time to establish trust and, you know, as, as you, as you said. Um, however, I had to <coughs> overcome some of the logistical difficulties of um, the probation hostel, which is, uh, I don't know how long I'll get these men for. They're not, it's not a school, you know, they come in, they go out, so, but I wanted to make sure there was a core group of at least the same people over the duration. That's why I kind of concentrated it. Um, so I think um, one, like I touched on it briefly, but the reason I use games or the board game, other than like I thought it's it, it's a kind of dark mirror to their lives, is that um, uh, playing is, is a nice way to ha test out uh, your fears and threats and emotions in a safe space. Because when you're playing, you know, um, you're, you're you're kind of in a magic circle where reality has been suspended. And if you feel like you're in a safe space, you can push yourself, or I feel you can push yourself a bit more to take 
path threats and, and see how you can react uh, without knowing there will be severe consequences. This is, this is why I use games. Uh, but, so, uh, um, I didn't know if they were going to like games, support games. Um, so I had to test out whether they were willing to do that or not. And um, So the first workshop was developing trust. And we played games without even saying we're going to make a game. Um, just brought lots of games. And then we had this discussion about playing, like what did you like playing as a child? What games did you play then? What games do you play now? And that sort of created a congenial environment where when you're talking about things you enjoy doing, you sort of start establishing a bit of trust. Um, and then we kind of, I don't think they knew what I was wanted to do. We just kind of went along with it. So I don't know <laughs> how much they, they thought this is going to like turn into a real thing. And I think uh, at the end, when they saw the prototype, they were actually surprised it looked like a real um, so we're always waiting for the, So, um, but I have to say it was um, because it was so concentrated, and uh, it was an environment where there's a lot of um, uh, I don't want to say trauma, but it's not it's not a happy place. Uh, so it was really important that I establish trust because I really wanted them to have these tough um, conversations um, about not just reflecting the system, but like their life philosophy um, as someone like from a marginalized group. So I started off with asking them just broad questions like, um, do you think life's fair? Why is it not fair? No one thought it was fair, by the way, <laughs> except for you. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, someone said life's okay, my life's okay. Um, and then I asked them like, why is it not fair? And we just did post-it notes. And we had group discussions about, um, about these things, or, or like, um, what's your goal in life? What does winning mean to you? Um, does prison work? How does society see you? How do you want society to see you? And um, it, it did get quite intense. Uh, and then I had to kind of channel all of that into like tasks so we could actually make a board game. And I think having sort of an end goal or objective to know, okay, I'm asking you these questions because of this. It did let us have more difficult conversations in terms of like, um, like who has it easier? <laughs> why, why is it, um, why is the card stacked against me? Or, you know, what makes it, what makes you want to get to this place? What makes you like relax or, um, and one of the interesting things about, like, when we talk about journeys and stuff was, uh, so you start off by being released from prison. That's the first square. And the last one is, uh, well, it, traditionally it would be home, where you want to reach the end. But for a lot of the men, home wasn't a, where they didn't want to go home, or they couldn't go home, or home is where a lot of st problems started. So this was a, a nice, this was like insight into like what a lot of the people were thinking. So in the end, we call it safe space. So that's where they want to go. Um, and I think like going through all of those big questions kind of uh, did open up space to talk about uh, emotional well-being or like life goals or what you want in life. And if you think about how the situation they're in now, it's not like from an objective point of view, they're not winning in life. So like, but if you still want to do that, like what, how would you play the hand you're dealt with now? So um, yeah, it was quite intense and that's five weeks. <laughs> and then um, we had a, a game play at the, I think we put in one extra session to play the prototype game with um, family members of like, the men as well. And that's when I really saw like their investment in this, in the ability to share it with like people that they're close with. Because that was also one of the questions I asked, uh, who do you want this audience to be? Who do you want this game to be played by? Because it's, and I made it very clear, this game is like, this game or artwork is not just for you. It's like 
to tell your story outside, and who do you want that audience to be? Yeah, yeah. No, it's the making. It's the making. Um, and then just really, really quickly, because we have kind of gone over what we um, intended in terms of kind of talking about it, is what we now think about the game plays. So we will be, um, apart from next week, I suppose as part of this next week when the world goes to a games festival as part of this pilot project, which is, um, has been so much longer than we thought, one of the last groups to play it. And you know, from, from my perspective, I'm sure it was too, it's really exciting that you come at it um, from a gaming perspective. Um, so I guess what we think about the gameplays, um, I definitely don't think they're fair. I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what that was, but yeah, in terms of if what we think about how people see us, I just make two or three points. Um, what part of this is data from, from our perspective is what's really, really interesting. Is any of it data? The conversations that you have in just a little while as you're working out the rules, is that data? Um, is any of this data? How, how do, when we're tasked with taking the key messages of this game into other audiences, how do we understand and conceive of data and those who participate within it? Um, from my perspective, I kind of have spent my career and, and I expect to spend the rest of my career trying to get people um, in, in government to listen to quite difficult um, findings. And they, as a rule, maybe aren't as open. The door isn't open in the same way as it has been with this game. Um, the interest we've had in this game has been absolutely outstanding. Um, and astounding in, in very many ways. So I'm really glad that this, uh, this has been played in the history of justice, it's been played um, by the parole board, it's been, it's been played in so many different arenas. And everybody coming to that game thinking it's something else. Um, whether that is a tool, whether it's an experience for empathy, whether it's a discussion generator, um, there is an awful lot of interest in the game and not just in the UK. We've had requests and this being made, translated into other languages, and so on. And I guess what we're, we're at at the moment is, um, a lot of people want a copy of probationary without knowing what probationary is. So what we're trying to make sense of at the minute um, is, is whether that, what that is about, and is that because of the materiality of this artwork looking like a board game, where the unfamiliar becomes very familiar? Um, what exactly uh, is that about? And I suppose that I would, I'd ask you to think about that as well and help us out with that if you have any sort of burning questions. So when I think about the gameplay, I'm really, really interested in what you, you think it is and perhaps you approach it today as a game, which would be one of the first times it's been a game. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think uh, as, as, a, as an artwork, um, the playing bit is as important as the way it was made. And the, the context of the gameplays is uh, becoming more of a, a focus for me. So if um, it, it does depend, uh, like even if you play uh, uh, Monopoly, each time you play it will be different depending on who's, who's around the table, which house rules you're following, um, whether it's in the morning or the afternoon or you know it's a rainy day. And all the conversations around the table will be different. Um, and and you, you'll learn through that process. So for me, the most interesting aspect has been taking it to people who deal with this on in a professional capacity, like the Ministry of Justice or the um, Prison and Probation Department, <coughs> and, and see how they think this reflects, like it gives them time to reflect on their profession. I think that's that's what it uh, it is, and if that can happen to influence the way they do their jobs, I think that would be um, the most amazing thing to me in terms of like what's happened since this was produced. And that, I guess, what the final sentence is. That's the only thing that Hawaii and I do agree on. Um, is what <laughs> What would be the most amazing outcome of this project? Um, and I know everyone's brought this along, and so it's okay to read that to you. There's somebody with it they did um, that had now moved through their role in the probation service and now work in the Ministry of Justice. And their feedback card um, was in a reflective mood did I do enough to support 
that is who I was supporting. And for me, I get goosebumps every time, and they're, and they're very, very, very real. That if that, for, I mean, from a criminologist perspective, but just from a human perspective, yeah. Um, if if the board game can make people think that, um, then all of our other disagreements we're good with. We we get to the same end point in a very different way. But thank you for listening. Um, do you want to play? Yeah. <laughs> so much. Before we play, people have got a chance for a few questions. Yes, yes, that, yes. And then, so maybe a few questions and then we can ask questions as we're playing as well. Um, could I start? Is that all right? Just, it's just be rude. Um, so, I find it so interesting. Emma, this question was to you really, because it's something you said really stuck with me. So when you <coughs> said, basically, is the men on parole's understanding of the system not actually the system and the criminal justice experts' understanding of the system their understanding rather than the reality. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's a good point to go back to because it is, it's still something um, that dominates our conversations now, but particularly about what we do with this project next, if anything, um, is that notion of what is this reflecting? Mm -hmm. Is this reflecting the, the policy? Because we can quite easily take out the policy and go, okay, so you go here, and here, and here, and that then dictates, and then it's the actual cards and the playing of the game that allow you to kind of think about the emotion. Whose who's, um, root is, is true and, and, and what should be important. Um, and in the end, um, it was decided that through probationary, unless there was a real, real issue of accuracy, that this would reflect how the men say that process is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, and there is there is a fair point because when we do play it with like professionals, like the um, for the probation board, um, one of them was saying this wouldn't happen. This wouldn't happen. Yeah. Like, it's not accurate. <coughs> and I think that conversation it is so important because if this did was to become a tool, and there are lots of conversations about that and lots of interest in this, actually, then the next sort of probationary part two, or the follow up being a design project, mm -hmm. and being a design project that involves a lots of different populations. But, um, and that has lots of different ways to play the game from, you know, in terms of different offences, but also in terms of diverse needs being covered with uh, et cetera. So that would be a very, very different process. And I would have gone through, through that very differently. And we would then have to put a little bit more of us in there and also um, a bit more of kind of policy makers in there. So this is a reflection of what the men who made it say happens. Does everyone else have a question? Yeah. Cool. That's not very I, I, I'll ask my money formula if you like. I, well, you, you, <laughs> sorry. I'm going to go first. Thank you. Um, you talked about how I talked about like get, making a game as like being a, or playing a game as being a safe space. So when, where I was actually maybe being interviewed about your experience in the probation service in fields, com or might feel combative or whatever. I thought it was really interesting. Is there any sense though where like actually playing this game doesn't feel safe? Like I might actually feel triggering. Well, not necessarily. Maybe triggering is the right word, but you know, like actually make, you know, make some of those traumas or the difficulties like really apparent and stuff. Uh, is it? I I don't know about playing it. I mean, like I I I won't know like people's background. And actually, like when I was uh, before I was introduced to the men, I said I don't want to know why they're. I don't want to know. Um, uh, but. Like halfway through, one, one of the men had to stop coming. He said, like, doing this like made him think back to being in prison. He couldn't deal with it anymore, so he stopped coming. I think as well, just, just to add to that, is it is um, when we think about the tool or who plays it, is it a uh, tool for who? Mm -hmm. So some people approach us and say, okay, could this be, you know, could this be in prisons that people play before they get released? And mm -hmm. um, from my perspective, absolutely not. Um, but in terms of other people don't say that. Other people, you know, think that's, is this a tool for students to, you know, play on the very first lecture that they have on probation studies um, to, to evoke some sort of understanding? Or is this a tool for, as I say, for the Howard League in terms of a, a, of a campaign to say whether this reflects reality or not? This is how people are, are kind of doing that. In terms of a safe space, um, I think that's really interesting, but one kind of comment we would do is we have played this um, with a group of people who'd just been released um, from prison but that weren't part of the project. And 
again, that, that raises those questions. What one of the feedbacks was, was this is absolutely brilliant. The feeling in my tummy when I was trying to work out the rules of the game was exactly the feeling in my tummy when I was trying to work out what was going to happen to me next. Mm -hmm. Now, again, ethically, you know, I, in terms of simulating trauma and so on. But yeah, I think, I think that notion of safe is really interesting. But, but also, um, the, the beauty of art, I feel, is like you, you can have confusion. You don't have to. But you can be challenging. Uh, you don't have to make everything nice. Uh, the safe space is to be able to have those anxious or nervous or, you know, without dire, yeah. dire consequences. Art can, art can challenge you and make you feel uncomfortable in a way that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to in social sciences. Sam, did you have a question? Sorry. Uh, uh, might be an observation, but when you're talking about, okay, would you do a version two and would it actually be approached more from a design perspective to make this thing that is really reflective of the book? Where wrong? It, it made me think, it, it seemed like very quickly the emphasis becomes on the object the sort of real magic in when you're talking about it is it was that collaborative process. It's great that there's a thing that was realised, but the, the people who got to work on that were very lucky because they got to shape it and contribute it and be really engaged for that time. And I guess if you were going, well, if we're going to do a version two that isn't just their experiences, maybe the emphasis won't be on the thing, but again, the process of all those agents. Is that a question? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just a beautiful comment in, in, in many ways. Um, absolutely. Um, what what probationary is, I think we call it at the start of it, was, you know, um, this bridge is an artwork um, that is the process of lots of different people, lots of different experiences and knowledge of the world coming into one place for 30 hours and talking about it with somebody as talented as a while to make sense of that. Um, it would be very, very, because if it wasn't a board game, um, and to use, I suppose, um, maybe not sort of the best example, but we've talked a lot about, you know, if the men had come together and paid pictures, that would have been really, really powerful, but we wouldn't have been asked to take those pictures to the Ministry of Justice. Um, it is the materiality in which, in which this art form has a kind of been realised that we believe has, has caused interest, and that's why having so many people around here that know so much more about games than I do. Um, to talk about those very things, you know, what what is the magic of this, um, and and what what kind of ethical spaces do you get into when games become tools? Take, take one more question. Oh, Could I just jump in? I say, Tim, quickly. Okay. Well, mine's fairly quick. I've I've been involved in the games industry for about twenty odd years. I have seen umpteen prototypes. This is extraordinary because I'm used to people coming and saying. I've designed this game, I'm going to print multiple copies, and I'm going to become very rich. Um, it's a fantasy that several people have. Uh, I have a bit of suspicion that this box here is possibly the only copy. There's four. Okay, that, that's interesting. Um, and my other question, I think I can guess the answer, is what's, what's the future here? Are you likely to be producing multiple copies, which will then go and be used, but that's prob probably a very open thing. You, you don't know quite what the future is. And this was a project which is now run for a lot longer than you expected, so yeah. it's fascinating. <coughs> From our perspective, what we should have had at the end of the five weeks was a series of questions over our criminology is useful in artistic workshops. That was, that was it, that's what we should have. We should have a nice little neat research paper, maybe in a nice journal for the ref. You know, this is where we're going, you know, let's talk about this. Um, and then our comfort with this, and, and all of our questions have been blown out of the water, and now we're left questioning what is this, and what is the future of this, and why. Um, and I think, again, I know in the I'll, I'll talk much more eloquently about this, is the reason we haven't gone into stage two or finished stage one is because we are so conflicted um, from our own moral sort of perspective about, about that, and, and ownership, and copyright, and IP, there is so many issues with this. Um, in terms of what happens when one institution commissions something and then, you know. Yeah. So we're a long way off that. I think there's a lot of interest for that to happen um, and a lot of resistance as well. And, sorry, I'll jump quickly. Yeah, I've got loads of questions, most of which I suspect will be answered through playing the game, so I'll, I'll hold all those on top. 
One question, Kwai, you said about the workshops, you talked about a flat hierarchy and you had the um, men on probation you're working with, the criminologists, yourself, people from probation service. Obviously, some of those parties aren't here. Uh, so the hierarchy kind of dissolves, clearly dissolves at some point. Um, I, won I wondered just really, what, what did the, the men who contributed to the, the make of this game think of it? What was, what was their sort of impression of the, of the end product? Um, I think you can answer that because I, after I run, finished the workshops, I never saw them again, oh. and I don't want to see them anymore. Um, we, I, abs I absolutely did. We followed up and we did interviews, and we, we like to keep in touch um, with both the space in which the game was created and the men's lives. Um, as a result of that, I think they were, if I can be quick, extremely proud. Um, extremely proud but also what kind of came across overwhelmingly in those interviews was you came in as a criminologist who said you were going to do something and you did it and that's what it becomes really interesting about that space was we didn't do anything um, but ultimately when you are in a criminal justice system and you're the person who goes back to you then you know you, you get kind of undue um, gratification I think um, but they couldn't believe that actually what was promised to them at the start of something actually happened um, they were really, really keen and excited that this would then be played in spaces they didn't feel that they would ever be able to get to. Um, and ultimately, um, so many of them learned um, how to tell their story in a space that wasn't therapy. Mm -hmm. But so, and they felt, I would say, extremely empowered. Um, and the very, very first time that this was played was at Oxford University, and I stood up and said, what does it mean to play this game in this space? Um, what does it mean to play the lives of the people who, who co-produce this with Hawa in such a privileged space? Um, so I think, it, I think it disrupts places, and you know, you're a games network, but hopefully the way in which it was made also disrupts, disrupts this space today as well. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you again to Emma. <laughs>